buildings today are dying prematurely. They're dying faster than they used to. They're dying faster, really, than they should. So when we evaluate architecture, usually we talk about how a building looks, and style is important. But today I want to talk about how the elements of architecture have consequences far beyond aesthetics. Around the world today, people are watching buildings they built in the 1950s come to the end of their lives today. They're watching buildings built in the 1960s come to the end of their lives today. And we're watching buildings built in the 1970s, even some in the 1980s, coming to the end of their lives already today. This means that the durability and therefore the sustainability of our architecture is decreasing by a decade, every decade. Whereas a century ago, it was reasonable to expect new buildings to span multiple generations. Today, disposable architecture is the new normal. By last measure, we're sending 170 million tons of building waste into our landfills every year. This is equivalent to almost 500 Empire State buildings. And disposable buildings are built on an unsustainable economic model. They contribute relatively little to the local economy because they're built quickly, with minimal labor, no craftsmen, and from component pieces that are shipped in from elsewhere. And consider the effect of 40-year buildings, the expense, the added-up expense on our taxes, how long before our new schools need rebuilding, our new public libraries, our new government office buildings, will it be again in our own lifetime? And when we don't build these buildings to last, we are squandering one of the rare opportunities we have to physically link generations and to provide our communities with a sense of rootedness and connection to place. In other words, when we build disposable buildings, we build disposable communities. Now here in Charleston, and really anywhere that has old buildings, we know how to build durably. There are examples all around us. Just look at this building we're in today. It was built 165 years ago as a train station, and it's now a popular music venue. But is it possible, then, that this disposable architecture of our time can simply be chalked up to that expression, they don't build them like they used to. No, not entirely. You see, there are solutions in these old buildings that are still relevant, very valuable solutions, that are being ignored by many architects for purely ideological reasons. You see, the architecture of the past was an architecture of place until about four or five generations ago when a group of architects, who would later be known as the modernists, had a new theory. And in the name of progress and innovation and originality, they promoted the latest innovations, and they rejected the use of tried and true traditional technologies, even when those technologies were superior. By the late 1930s, architects were campaigning to stop teaching traditional principles in architecture schools altogether. They succeeded. Durability declined, and we began to lose our architecture of place. Now, the design that I practice and advocate for is not a fake old architecture, as those modernists would have called it. It's a progressive, traditional architecture. It's an architecture of place that's free to make use of the best technologies, whether they're older technologies or the latest innovations. The most common cause of early death in our new buildings is not structural. These buildings are not going to fall down. It's actually biological. Mold infestation, caused by water infiltration plus heat, is causing our buildings to rot from the inside out. So when we look at these two buildings on the screen, they have a fairly similar aesthetic. But if we do a little detective work, we look into their technologies, we see that they actually function quite differently. And it's the older technologies, the thick masonry walls, the pitched roof that's hidden behind that parapet there, and the operable windows that outperform and will outlast the newer technologies, the thin, panelized wall system, or skin, the flat roof, the fixed windows. And there are other older technologies that are useful today, too, but are vastly underused, such as the water-shedding molding. To explore this a little further, we're going to take a look at the cornice, or crown molding. This is the molding that runs horizontally across the top of the buildings. You can see their shadow lines here. And in, as we zoom in, 
the uh, primary purpose of a cornice is to shed water away from the face of the building and especially to, project the, to protect the joint between the wall structure and the roof structure. And as we look at this durable tripartite or three-part cornice, we see exactly how it works. The water sticks to the front of those moldings until it reaches the point, uh, this break, that we call the drip. And the water does just that. It drips away from the face of the building. A properly designed cornice can prolong the life of a building significantly. An improperly designed cornice, or an abstract cornice as we see here, can actually do damage to the building by pulling the water down along the face of the wall and directing it right into that joint the cornice is meant to protect. In subtropical Charleston, South Carolina, it's not just water, but heat, and famously humid heat, that we need to manage in order to prolong the lives of our buildings. In Charleston, you'll see porches all over the place. Charleston is a city of porches, and that's no wonder, because the best way to manage hot, humid heat is through shading. So as you walk around, you'll notice our porches are almost exclusively on the south and west face of the buildings, because those are the faces that receive the longest and hottest sun exposure throughout the day. As we see in the durable building here, these are what, uh, both the south facades of the two buildings we have, and the durable building is making use of that brilliant old technology, the porch, that's uh, shading the wall, it's shading its south face, and so it's working with the air conditioner on the inside to keep the building cool in a balanced way. On the other hand, the disposable building, not only do they choose not to make use of the porch, but they make their south face predominantly of glass. There is no worse, I see you get this too, you see, you've seen it. There's no worse material for mitigating heat gain than glass, even when they put the dark films on it. And so, and in this case where their windows are fixed, it essentially creates the system of a greenhouse. So the air conditioner, in order for the building to be habitable at all, the air conditioner has to run 100% of the time. And you would think they would know better. This is a college science building. <laughs> now, we are making some progress. There's a small but growing global movement underway tradi of traditionalists or classicists who are working to return these old technologies back into architectural curriculum. And we're making progress. Like I said, students are even coming to us asking for extracurricular courses so they can learn these things. But just like the food movement, we need your help too. We need the help of consumers and taxpayers and citizens who can create demand for durable buildings. So tell your elected officials you want your tax dollars to pay for durable, legacy buildings, not disposable ones, and challenge architects, developers, and builders to commit to your community with an architecture of your place. Demand durable buildings, and we'll build sustainable communities. Thank you.